Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. It's entitled When Good Food Goes Bad and How to Investigate a Failing Map Package and Optimize Your Map Processes. So we use the term MAP, uh, that stands for Modified Atmosphere Packaging. And I thought the way we would start this webinar would just be to just to kick it off with the idea of you know a question out to everyone. So I'm going to send the question out uh, basically is, you know, have you ever experienced an issue with your map packaging and really didn't know why it was failing? And there's a couple different responses that you can give, and we'll review those responses. In the interim, I want to relate a story from the consumer perspective, so things that I experienced. And to do this I, it reminds me of basically a, a, a story that I have from my personal experience of making a, a dish at home uh, of scalp potatoes. And it's kind of a, it's a traditional family dish that we make. It's a good comfort food, nice Sunday dinner. And in our house, you know, it's, it's, the recipe is pretty simple. You know, you've got your cream of mushroom soup, you got your milk, your butter, your flour, maybe a little salt and pepper, and of course, your sliced peeled potatoes. And if you ever peeled potatoes, you know that as soon as you peel them, they can start turning color a little bit. Uh, and the whole process of cooking the, this recipe, you know, is you bake it at 350 for over a little over an hour. And it can always be kind of a, you know, it's fun in the kitchen sometimes, scrubbing those potatoes, slicing them, and peeling them up. Other times it can be quite a chore. So what we've done in our house just lately is we've actually transitioned to using a pre-sliced potato. It can be found in our local grocery store, and it works out really nice. Uh, it's little pouches and uh, we need about two pouches for this recipe. And really what happened is, the last time we were ma making this, my wife and I, uh, we laid out, we opened up the first pouch, took out the potatoes, and these potatoes look awesome. They're bright, white, nice and fresh. I'd, I'd say almost better than I could do myself um, in some ways, just like those apples you see, like at, it, you know, in stores that people have, it's like, how do they keep it so fresh and good? This potato, Sliced potato was very fresh and very good. Laid it out in the pan, put our cream sauce over it, laid out the flour, a little butter, go to the second layer, start working on that. Then I have to go to the second pouch. Open up the second pouch, open up, pull out some potatoes, and it was a little grayer in color. Not that fresh, crisp, white potato. Um, and then it hit me. There's a little bit of an odor coming out of this. It was like, oh, what's going on in here? I'm sitting, I'm by my, I'm in the kitchen, I'm by the sink. And I kind of put the pouch out, hold it out, and the sunlight's coming in. I look inside, and yep, further down in this, this pouch, the discoloration is even worse. It goes from the gray to the very dark to black. And what's interesting about this package is it's a pouch. It's a great pouch, high barrier pouch made out of foil, metalized structure, I mean foil structure. And being held up now to the light was, I could see actually a pinhole down further. I could see light coming through. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know what, there was a hole in the back. And the hole did something. It changed, it changed the environment. And ultimately, those slices were poor. They were bad. So what we ended up doing, of course, I had to run out and get some more and, and, and we finished the recipe. But this really illustrates how you can have a good product and a bad product. It came from the same uh, lot, from the same area, but something happened in distribution. Whether it, whether it was in the distribution from the manufacturer to the store, from the store onto the shelves, or even on the grocery trip home in, in our car. Who knows exactly when it happened, but it happened. So what I want to talk about within this presentation are the tools that someone can use when they're trying to look at a package that consistently was working and now it's not. Because there's questions of why did it go bad? And, uh, to talk about that, the tools, I'll first talk about modified atmosphere packaging. Oh, let me go back. Let's see what the results were of the, of the quiz. The results were of it, you know, never. Some people had no issues at all. I think that, that, that's pretty high, uh, and that's really good. Some had issues. Some had issues, uh, but they found it was a production issue. That might have been, you know, maybe what I perceived as maybe something on the production in the, in the handling of the product uh, created the, the hole within that pouch. 
And some, you know, they never were able to find the issue. And that can be very troubling at times because, you know, if it's something that comes and goes, is it something that, you know, how, is it, how can you control it and keep it from happening again? Because ultimately, when, ultimately when you're putting your product out there, that's your brand, that's, that's your ownership, that's what you're known for. And people may second guess of using your brand if they're getting intermittent, fa intermittent failures or, or bad product. So that's uh, a really a good representation of the group that, that's attending. A lot of different answers, I, I really appreciate that. So I wanna get into, now, you know, if something is failing, how do I investigate it? What tools uh, can I use? So to start out with that, oops, I will go into the uh, why do we use modified atmosphere packaging. So my case with potatoes, uh, fresh potatoes, is, is actually is very evident. You know, if you cut a sliced potato, it can turn gray. And over some time, even if I was going to pre-slice it the night before and put it in my refrigerator, they wouldn't look very appetizing the next morning when I'm going to make my dish. Uh, when you manufacture a product, like potato chips. Uh, potato chips are, are, are you know, they're, they're, they're whole processed, they're, they're fried, um, and you want to protect that. Um, you might have oils on that, so within the shelf life or maintain the shelf life to make sure that the product is fresh to the consumer, uh, you're going to take careful uh, consideration of the packaging and the environment around it. So in the case of a potato chip, what you have here is something that could have some oils on it. So you may be you know, concerned about oxidation, rancidity, things that are going on in that nature. But also you might be concerned about the crispness of the chip. Keep it in a dry environment. So this is a product that when you see on the shelf is normally packaged within a high barrier material. So it might be a foil, might be a metallization. And also where the atmosphere around it has been modified, it has been changed. It wasn't just packaged in in there under, net, under normal conditions and sealed. In this case, many times what they do is that they'll, they'll, they'll flush it or they'll purge it with nitrogen to get that oxygen out from the air and also if there's any ambient humidity to get that down very low. Um, unlike potato chips, sometimes you'll find corn or corn chips that might be in a paper bag, uh, more consumable, uh, easier to, you know, easier to use, and, but you may also find it in foil as well. Corn and potatoes are two different vegetables, completely different. A potato is a tuber, it's underground. Uh, its skin, when intact, makes a great barrier for it. When you cut it up, then it will degrade actually pretty, pretty quickly. Corn itself has a lot of natural antioxidants within it. And because of that, when you process it, it's, it can be a more hardy product. So with this in mind, when you package this, you may not need to use that modified atmosphere as much or that, that expensive packaging. However, what happens when you add like a flavor to it? In this case, let's think of a cheese puff that's corn-based. If the cheese is dairy-based, well, we know that milk itself doesn't like to sit out at room temp, at room atmosphere, it'll spoil. So if you've got a dairy-based, additive to this, now you need to protect it. So then you have to look at modified atmospheres and good packaging around it. If, if the additive isn't dairy-based, um, then you can get away with packaging things more with a, a moderate atmosphere. Maybe, maybe you still flush it with a dry gas to keep things nice and crisp, and you, maybe you still package around it to keep humidity from coming inside, but maybe you don't have to get that oxygen level down like you would with the uh, with a potato chip. So the biggest take takeaway is we modify our atmospheres to, to extend the shelf life, make sure our customers are receiving good product at the table, you know, when they're purchasing it, when they open it up and they have a great experience. And the biggest takeaway is different vegetables, different foods have different demands. So in the whole process of using a modified atmosphere, uh, and it, it's a kind of a complex process, if I break it down pretty simply, is that we're going to move, you know, this, this picture illustrates that it starts with good science. You've got food chemists, you've got these food chefs, they're developing recipes. And they have to think about, do I want to put preservatives in them? Do I not? Do I want to cut that back? What do I want my shelf life to be? 
So they're doing things, they're looking at how the product behaves over time, and what's the ultimate atmosphere or the packaging that it really should be around it. So the packaging folks, the food science people, they should all be working together. If they decide that, yeah, I want to use a modified atmosphere. I, I want to not just have ambient air in there. I want to do something to it. Maybe I want to add a gas to it. And, and sometimes adding gases to it can help prolong that shelf life, help change the chemistry a little bit of that food um, and, and the like. So what I showed down the lower left-hand corner is a guide to map mixtures. This is a common guide that you can actually get from a lot of equipment manufacturers that sell uh, you know, map applications, uh, gas manufacturers, or people that actually sell instruments for analyzing these gases. Uh, and in the example here, it's for raw red meat. A quick guide shows you know, a reference between if I'm going to put in CO2 versus oxygen and at what level. And again, these are just guides. Ultimately, the food scientists will look at the processes that are actually being involved with, 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 the, with the product that they're developing and the packaging, and maybe they want to change these concentrations a little bit. But you'll have guides for all sorts of different meats and vegetables and the like, and it can be a, you know, it's a real science there. So, so once you have your formulation, you've got your idea of your mixtures, you have to look at your package in the, in the process of it. So on upper right, I'm showing a, you know, a package coming off the line. It had a modified atmosphere, which means in this case, room air was flushed out of it. A very particular uh, gas was put into it. It was sealed. So I've got a tray and I've got a lidding. And they're all sealed together with the goal or the intention to keep that atmosphere in place. I don't want room air coming in. I don't want my atmosphere that's inside going out. And then the last piece of that is, is really understanding what's my distribution? Where is it going? Um, if it's going into, you know, is, is it shelf stable? It can go on a normal, normal shelf at room temperatures. That product might go into a warehouse where it receives higher temperatures. If it's refrigerated through its, through its whole chain of distribution, does it really maintain that refrigeration temperature? Um, a lot of foods we're seeing nowadays is people are trying to go away from preservatives and making things fresher and maybe have more meals that are very easy to prepare at home. Um, is you see more refrigerated products that are very kind of high-end, high-scale, and trends that are going on there. So to get those shelf lives, you, it might just be I'm packaging this meat or this, this meatloaf or, or this product on Monday. Can it be good for three weeks or two weeks? We're not even talking months at this case for some of these people. All right. So the whole map process, there's a science behind it. Uh, there's a skill set, you know, from, again, from the developing the product, to choosing how we want a packaging, choosing the right packaging materials and the whole distribution. So we're gonna talk about what tools can I have to review my map product. Um, what I've got is, whoops, pretty simply, is I'm showing here is that the first tool that you use is trying to understand what did I fill my package with? What gases did I put in? I used a mixture of CO2 and oxygen to keep that red meat red. Then how do I, how do I verify? So you can have a system shown on the upper left with gas mixers that can adjust these ratios to online analyzers that say, this is what I'm filling my package with. And having a system like this in place helps really optimize your process because you know how you filled it. And you've got proof, you've got recorded data, so if something goes bad down the road, you can kind of go back, look in time, when was it filled, what were the conditions, and was anything kind of off at that, at that point. So when doing an investigation, the first thing you can look at is confirming how you modified that atmosphere. That's a great tool. Um, if maybe you don't have that access to that information, the next thing to look at is how does this, how did my modified atmosphere, my map atmosphere, behave after filling? And to do that, traditionally, people use headspace analyzers. So in the upper right hand uh, is a photo of someone using a handheld hand, headspace analyzer where they put a septa on their package, and they've got this needle and tubing, so they'll pierce into the package, it's a gas type steel, and the instrument itself has a pump that'll suck out a little bit of headspace, it'll flow into the analyzer, and it'll tell you how much oxygen you have in there, how much CO2 you have in there, 
And from that, you can understand, did you actually modify the atmosphere as you intended? That's a great tool. And a lot of people use this in a QC basis, just online, they'll pull a sample out, verify, yep, things are going great, they're going good. Something I will mention, it's kind of interesting, is a lot of foods, because how they're processed, they may have, they already have air absorbed within them. Think of a cheese pot, it's all air, a lot of air there. So if you're gonna flush that with nitrogen and put a lot of gas into it and seal it up, you can have a very low oxygen concentration, but if you wait a little while, that air that was absorbed in there can permeate out and come into an equilibrium with that headspace around it, it's kind of cool. So what happens a lot of times after doing this gas flush and this filling, and you, you verify it, uh, if you look, if you wait an hour or even a day, you might find those levels rise. It's not totally uncommon. So it's something to understand, but it's also it's a data point saying, you know, I thought I got it down to 0.1% oxygen, but really over the day, after day, it went up to 1% oxygen. As long as you can maintain your shelf life and you know those numbers, that's okay. But you've got the data there to verify your packaging is performing the way you want it to. A second way to look at things that isn't as invasive as putting a needle in, is in the lower left-hand corner, is there could be a sensor that you put inside. In this case, it's the fluorescence-based uh, detection method where I have a special lighter laser that looks at this little chemistry uh, that's stuck on the inside of that lidding of that meat tray. And from there, I can tell what the percent oxygen is inside of there. Now, this little tool, this piece, this little sensor in there, it's really, it's not for consumption. So you couldn't sell this out to the marketplace, but you could use a tool like this to understand what's going on with your chain as, you, as it's being processed through. You could take samples from of the headspace to understand what is my oxygen level over time, and you can look at it through the distribution. And that'll give you good information on what is happening to that package over time. Are you maintaining your modified atmosphere the way you wanted to and that you intended to? Uh, the fourth picture in the lower right, I just kind of put in there is that, that using that same kind of fluorescence technology, but in a, now in an invasive approach where we're poking into a package, uh, this is a package that's pretty cool. It's a newer on the market. It, it, it's, it's freshly prepared, really, meal that you put in the microwave and you heat. And when it's sealed, they did a modification. You know, they could do a gas flush. They pull a vacuum on it. You can understand if you pull a vacuum, you don't have a lot of headspace. So, like the picture above it that's pulling out, you know, two to four milliliters or cc's of gas, you may not have that in a package that has a vacuum or a very, very small headspace. So there is a tool that you can go into. This one has a little needle with the, that fluorescence on the tip of it, so I can go right into the package. I can still measure the percent oxygen that's in there. So even on something like this, where it's a very small headspace, we can still get that information to verify that we did actually meet uh, the, the modified atmosphere packaging specifications that we set up when we're producing the package. So that's a pretty cool tool. Uh, what's neat about this too, is I mentioned that because, you know, if you have a vacuum app application, this particular uh, sensor with the needle has a pressure transducer built in with it as well. So it automatically compensates the percent oxygen to give true percent oxygen value. So you don't have to worry about pressure differentials and things like that. It gets pretty nit nitpicky, but it's a cool tool to use. So I talked about tools that are commonly used when you're trying to do some troubleshooting and understand why did my package go bad? What's wrong with it? What's different from it? How can I look at my, my atmosphere? The next thing I want to talk about really is uh, a tool to, tools that people can use to look at leaks in the packages. So before I get into that, I wanted to actually talk about what's the importance of a leak. And to illustrate that, um, our, our group in Denmark, um, Dan Sensor, worked with a worked with a group, a research group, to create a study to understand how different hole sizes could impact the atmosphere within a package. And there's more of a write-up that if you have interest on this, just email us and we can we can give you more detail. But the gist of it is, is they created these packages with beam film. It's a modified atmosphere where they flushed the air out and they got the oxygen down to 0.1% oxygen very, very low level. 
and then they set up samples with known hole sizes, known orifice sizes, uh, ranging from 500 micron diameter down to 50 micron diameter. And the result of the tests are actually pretty cool. What it shows is that a hole of 500 micron diameter, you know, if I put all that time, that effort, that money into flushing my package and sealing it, I was really close to atmospheric 20% oxygen within a day. Really, within three days, I was there. If I look at the lower size, it's like 100 microns, and then put that in perspective, that's the diameter of a human hair. We're not talking about a gaping hole, like the big hole that you know I saw in my uh, sliced potato package. But it is a hole nonetheless. And even a hole of that small of a size, within 24 hours, all that time, all that effort, all that energy, all that expense, to create an atmosphere of 0.1% oxygen now increased to 7% oxygen, and it starts approaching room air then closer, you know, as you approach three days. If we even go smaller in size to half a micron, again, half the diameter of a human hair, I mean 500 microns, again, half the diameter of a human hair, after 24 hours, the atmosphere inside there is already up to 3.5%, 10% after 72. Now, how does this relate to shelf life? Well, if you have a meat, product that you're trying to keep oxygen out of to extend its shelf life, obviously these small holes are making large impact on this atmosphere that I created. Every product will be different, much like the potato and the corn examples and what they need and what they require. But the second tools I'm going to talk about are looking at leaks. How do we evaluate leaks in a package? So for that, the first method, it's kind of, this may seem really, really weird, but People do it, and it's actually used quite a bit. When I say it's used quite a bit is you put a package underwater and you look for bubbles. Now, you may not put on a diving suit, going in a pool. I know that's taking it to an extreme, and that would be kind of fun to do if we had our lab set up to do that here. But the reality is, is that a lot of people use this. They're looking for holes, they put it underwater, and they're looking for bubbles. So and they can just have a sink that's filled with water, and they put it in, and they do it. Uh, there can be a lot of variability. If uh, one person squeezes on the package more than another, they might see something a little different. Or one puts it deeper underwater. So to do this type of a test, and we want to make it more science-y, there's an ASTM method, which is pretty nice. ASTM F 2096. And what we do is we'll, we'll, we'll have to do, be invasive to the pouch. So we'll put a septa on it, we'll put a line into it, and we'll then inflate the pouch and we'll hold it underwater. And this is an example of that, you know, the nice acrylic tank with uh, the sample placed underwater. To do this test, you know, you may, you'll have to like rotate the pouch around, look at all angles, and it works pretty nice. And a great use of this is that if you can locate, bubbles are always coming out from a specific seal or corner or intersection, you can go back to your ceiling line and try to optimize that better. Looking for these visual defects like this or these visual holes is a great tool. It really is. One of the side points is, though, is that a bubble is actually pretty large. In fact, when you look at the standard, it's a visual standard, so how it's incorporated, who looks at it, you know, it's very subjective. Uh, we can all look at, like in this example, a streaming bubble path. That, that's pretty obvious. But sometimes when seals are together, you might just have some air that's trapped within the seal coming out. So you have to watch it for some time. However, it's not very sensitive. Uh, it's really used within the industry a lot to look at holes down to 250 micron diameter. Now, what's that in comparison? One well, that meat study I showed you earlier, 100 micron hole diameter, size of a human hair, changed my 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 atmosphere significantly in 24 hours. This test method has even has very low accuracy and less precision when you get to smaller and smaller hole sizes. So visually it's good, helps optimize a lot of things, but it's still in, in the scheme of things, the modified atmosphere, it's still, it tends to be a pretty gross scale. So it's a good tool to still use, um, but it's still kind of subjective. I've got a gentleman here putting this underwater. If he, what if he's squeezing it more and how is he holding it? Uh, an alternate to that method is kind of different. Instead of piercing the package and inflating it, 
what we're showing here is on the left is a chamber. Uh, looks like a desiccator, really. It's two, two halves. On the bottom half, we can put water inside. We can put a package underneath. And I apologize, this really isn't the best photo, but it's illustrated the whole system. Is that we've got a pouch that I put underneath. I've got an acrylic um, shelf there. It's holding it underwater. I can see through it. And then on the top, I've got these feed-throughs where I can actually pull a vacuum on the headspace above it. And what this does is when the vacuum is pulled, it's much like when a package is changing eleva elevation. You know, you're, you're going from sea level up to Denver. You may bring a, a potato chip bag with you or something like that. And it inflates. It balloons. It goes up. And the idea is, is that I'm not piercing into the package. I'm just putting it underwater. I'm holding it. And when I pull a vacuum on top of it, the package will inflate. And as it inflates and it gets taut, then you'll see if there's any leaks or bubbles coming out. So it's still a bubble test or a leak test, but I'm not handling it. And it's in, in some of these systems, you can just have a vacuum pump, you can have a uh, you know a valve, and you can have someone you know with a stopwatch as they're doing the test. Or like this in this photo here, it's more automated. So it always goes to the same vacuum level. It always goes for the same amount of time. You can record things with printouts. So it's very similar that we're looking for gross leaks. We're looking for bubbles. So still visually, you know, that 250 micron hole size is kind of industry accepted. You might be able to standardize around some smaller holes if you go to a lot of, a lot of the, you know, the effort of, of that. But it doesn't have the greatest sensitivity. Another methodology that people can use for looking at leaks uh, is it's a test we call a pressure decay test and explained very well within the ASTM standard F2095. And in this test, it's, it's a multi kind of component test, is I'll have a pouch or a package. So in this case, we're showing a pouch. It could be a tray with a lidding on it. And we'll put a septa on it, and then we'll pierce in through that septa. And that's what the apparatus on the left is showing. And then we'll inflate the pouch, and we'll make it taunt. And the test is actually there's three steps. The first step is to inflate it. So on the graph on the right, we're showing step one, is I'm going to inflate this up to a known pressure. The second thing is to hold that pressure. And the reason why we hold that pressure is there's a lot of materials that under pressure will stretch a little bit, or seams that might give a little bit, called creep. And we want that to settle. Uh, what's nice about this method, you don't need a ton of pressure. You just need it to make it taut, you need to hold it, You'll need a pressure transducer that's really sensitive enough to measure uh, you know, these pressures that we're working with. So once we held the pressure and to making sure you know, that the package is stable, it's really not changing, then what we do is we, we hold that pressure, we don't put any more pressure into it, and then theory is if there's any leaks, if there's any holes, anything wrong with that package, we can now measure a pressure drop. So on the graph on the right, you see a very slow pressure drop. And this is this is pretty normal because what's going on is maybe the sample's still stretching a little bit more. And when it stretches, this volume gets bigger because I now have just a, a, a single pressure I put into it. With a larger volume, we should expect a little bit of a pressure drop. That's very normal. If there's a very large pressure drop, then we would have a hole or some, you know, some channeling, something going on that's compromising our system. So within this kind of test method, it works really nice. Uh, it's been standardized, really, if you look at the ASTM standard, the ILS, the Inner Laboratory Study, which is kind of the holy grail to all ASTM methods, it shows how good a method is, uh, really standardized this around the smallest hole size of about 12 and a half micron hole size. Much, much smaller than that human hair. Nominally, a lot of people use it around 25 micron hole sizes. What's nice is you can have a package, you can have a control package off to the side where you can put a known controlled orifice measured hole size on it. So you can have controlled standards that you can actually use uh, for pass fail criteria. That type of information is like very important to pharmaceutical areas uh, when they're looking about seal integrity, uh, but for our food as well, very, very applicable. So it's a great test method to find some of these very small hole sizes. So I showed you three methods that are kind of commonly offline used to evaluate a package. Uh, you can evaluate, evaluate good versus bad. 
Uh, they can be used to understand where the issues of the areas are when you're looking at a bubble. That looks pretty nice. Or if you need greater sensitivity, uh, a test method like this, like pressure decay, can work very well. You can. So the next thing, so I've, I've already talked about the modified atmosphere and verifying that environment. And the second thing I talked about now is possible leaks and things that are going on with it. So the third thing, really that's important, is permeation. Did I choose my packaging well? Did I choose my packaging in a way that when I put all this time, expense, effort into creating a modified atmosphere, are my packaging materials going to keep it intact? We talked about how you seal the materials together. That's what that leak testing was for. But now I'm talking innately, were the materials chosen correctly? And one way to think about this is, is I like to use the example of a carbonated soft drink, a soda pop. And we all know that, yeah, it's carbonated, it's fizzy, and it works really well. And when they carbonate those, they usually carbonate it up to like four atmospheres of pressure, a ton of CO2 inside of there. And from a consumer perspective, when that soda goes bad, it's because it's less fizzy. It changes its flavor profile and how it is across the tongue and all this science in there is pretty cool. So the biggest concern is choosing material to make sure that, it's, that your soda pop stays carbonated for its given, test, or for its given shelf life. Uh, in fact, if you, what people don't understand is, is a lot of that CO2 is coming through the walls of the bottle. It's not just the closure. A lot of people think, oh, it's just leaking out the cap. And if they could get a better cap on, this thing would last forever. It's not true. It's coming out the PET or the polymer sidewalls of that bottle. So it's very important that they choose it well. When you think about bottles, and you think about a lot of people trying to get the polymer content down, get your grams down, get your weight down. Uh, and you look at water bottles. You'll, see, you'll find a lot of water bottles that are like paper thin. You can't do that with a soda pop bottle. Because if you make it really thin, you lose that CO2 barrier, and then your shelf life goes down. So they're, in that niche, in that group, they have to maintain a certain wall thickness to keep their product carbonated and maintain its shelf life and its flavor profile, and I can enjoy my favorite beverage, which is good. Um, in fact, it's kind of interesting, a little side note, there's a few years back, with a whole group that studies this stuff, a group called International Society of Beverage Technologists, when they're looking at lightweighting the bottle, they're putting a lot of the effort into the neck. You know, can I make that smaller? Just reduce that 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 carbon footprint. And, and they did it. They did a great job with it. So back to these photos. What I'm showing you there is we've got a, a fresh pizza that's manufactured. And this idea to be fresh, it'll go in a distribution cycle or it's refrigerated, someone brings it home. It's really meant to be used in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, to maintain its freshness, it's it is packaged within a modified atmosphere. I want to get some of that oxygen out. And so when they when they do this, they have to choose a packaging material that keeps, you know, the, the, the oxygen out, that keeps the cheese good, nice and fresh, keeps the bread nice and fresh. And on the lower right, I show a, a graph of different materials. And they're ranked from at the very top, where it says 10,000, those are high oxygen transmission rate materials. So we've got low density polyethylene, uh, you know, it's very high at the top of the scale, goes down to, you know, biaxially oriented polypropylene. Uh, you go down further, you get, an, you know, oriented polyethylene terephthalate. So these are all, you know, PETs, these, these are all things that represent different polymer types. These different polymers will behave differently. Uh, they're different barrier characteristics. So one type of wrap isn't always the same as the other. So if you've got a product that you've been selling, it's been doing really well, and all of a sudden now in the marketplace, it's failing, maybe across the board. You've, you've, you've verified, you know, I filled it correctly. I go back, I check my logs, the map process was good. Uh, we, you know, we did our QC checks. You know, one thing to look at, was your materials the right, same material? Maybe the specs changed, or maybe the person supplying you the materials gave you material that didn't quite meet your specifications. So knowing what your materials are and what those specifications is very important. So what I put up there kind of above that table are kind of common permeation material specifications. It's kind of weird. This is what they do. But for oxygen, in most cases, when you find a film material, it's going to be tested at 23C, 73F, 
and with dry gases around it. And with water vapor, a lot of times it's an elevated temperature, 37.8 C, 100 F, pretty very, actually very warm, and 90% RH. So when you look at these material specifications, you know, if you've got a product that's going in a refrigerator, and you're trying to understand how much water could be moving into or out of my packaging at that lower temperature, it's a different level, different rate than what that common material specification is. So if you're trying to understand shelf life, when you're choosing your materials, you should test at those environments. What I wanted to get across here is a lot of like specifications, especially for, for films, samples, again, oxygen or 23C and dry. And what I like about this table, uh, the graph down below, it says, hey, if I, if I look at this variety of material, and if I'm not testing dry, I, well, I'm testing dry on, on the left side of this, but on the right side, I start adding humidity. What you're going to find there are certain materials that are moisture sensitive. What that means is when exposed to humidity, uh, they might swell, they might change, they might plasticize, they might be a little more elastic. They go through some kind of uh, a change in a way that they allow now more oxygen to come through. So as an example, at the very bottom, um, we've got um, a table that has like a, a very high barrier sample. It works really, really well, but when you add humidity to it, it doesn't work quite as well. In fact, normally when people are using this type of material, uh, they would sandwich it within other structures to help protect it from humidity and really maintain its barrier, uh, its barrier effectiveness. So when you're burying that material in, these moisture sensitive materials, um, you know, did you bury it well? Was it, was it, was it, was it extruded right, the right laminates and, and the like, and was it verified? Things to consider. Um, but a big thing is, you know, if, if someone's starting with a brand new product and they're looking at film specs saying, hey, I have this great product, and I found this great barrier, and I made a bowl out of it, okay? But if the bowl was had material that's moisture sensitive, and you put a soup inside, it may not behave the way that you calculated it to behave. It may not provide the barrier that you thought it would provide. So keeping in mind that material, some materials are sensitive to humidity, or materials can change, it's very important that you look at your packaging specifications. What did you ask? From your suppliers they provide you was it verified in does it make sense for what, you, what your product is you know maybe the packaging for a wet product should be different than for a dry product or at least the like on the lower left and it's kind of also illustrated on, on the upper left too but on the lower left is kind of like a little cross section of a foil pouch foil is an ultimate great barrier material okay However, if you process it too hot, when you seal it, you've got clamping jars, you've got clamping bars, you know, you got your time as well, and all this stuff. Uh, sometimes if you've got seals or multiple seals on top of each other, uh, it can be kind of hard on the material. So what I mean by that is, is that maybe the metal could be a little deteriorated. So in this section where we open up a pouch, I have a bright light behind it, and I can see light coming through, that may not be a through hole. Okay, but it means light's coming through. And if light's coming through, I can guarantee oxygen's coming through or water vapor's gonna come through. Now, it could be a very small amount because of what we see here, but if you just assume that when you created your package, when you created your pouch, or when you sealed your foil lidding on your tray that you've got a hermetically great, great seal, all your products are good, the actual package might be different just due to the processing of it, might have done some changes to it. Uh, on the example of the pizza above, it shows a great barrier film, you know, and, they, and when you look at that, you say, you know, when I'm coming around the corners, I'm stretching that material a little bit, okay? Do you think it has the same barrier now that I've stretched material than it would be more pristine in the middle, okay? Our experience is if we're gonna measure how oxygen or water vapor move through that section where it's more stretched, we're gonna find a higher net oxygen or water vapor transmission rate. So understanding, you know, what's the wear and tear that I'm putting on my package in the process, you know, can help you. So, you know, looking back, you know, we talked about, I have this modified atmosphere, put a lot of, a lot of effort into creating it, a lot of time and effort, uh, you know, in the process and making my formulations and choosing my gases and then verifying it, making sure the final package configuration is, is living up to its, its, its intent is, is, is very important uh, to do.
So that was kind of like the, uh, you know, the, the, the last point on this. So to recap, you know, trying to look at what tools would someone use when they're trying to evaluate when my good food's gone bad, uh, is really verify, was your map effective? If you can do it with online records and things like that, that's awesome. Verifying it afterwards with QC checks or through distribution and making sure that you're maintaining that map environment that you intended is, is, is a great uh, you know, effort to do. The next thing is, you know, since I made this package, did I actually seal it well? Were things caught in the seals? Maybe some food was caught in there. Maybe uh, the heat bar wasn't warmed up yet right or things like that. So verifying that is leak-free whether it's a bubble test, pressure decay test. There's other tests too, some more of that, but like online tests. Uh, there are online tests that, you know, if, if you're doing online, if you're filled with, maybe you use CO2 in your map. That, there's things that can sniff around it looking for, for CO2 loss and the like. Um, there's, there, there's things that you can do, but verifying that it's leak-free uh, is, is, is the next really good step. And the third is really, can the package you design really maintain that map environment? Maybe you chose materials that are good, but you overprocess. Maybe someone got a little more zealous on the heat sealing because they're having a hard time and lidding was coming off too easy, so they cranked up their pressure. And, and all of a sudden now, that extra pressure on it might be degrading that film in that area. And now I can have more permeation. So it could be the process of that uh, or the materials. Maybe I got a new batch of materials in and it really didn't quite meet the specifications that I needed. And then keep in mind, a lot of the specs that you'll see, you know, are they relevant to the, the food that you're packaging, to the product that you're packaging? So in summary, uh, those are the three big uh, areas to look at. If you've got a currently really good product that intermittently has some problems or some issues, and these are good tools uh, that anyone can use to help kind of verify, you know, what's going on and get a good baseline of my good food versus my poor film, and my poor food and, and the like. So as far as the presentation goes, that's really the conclusion of, of that area. So I guess at this point, we'll open it up to questions. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. That was very informative. All right. So if you guys could get your questions ready, go ahead and type those into the question and answer box in your control panel, and we'll do a short Q&A session here. I do have a couple coming in. We'll give you guys a couple minutes to type in your questions now. All right, Joel, so, so the first question we have is, you showed a picture of a needle piercing into a meat tray, um, and it looked like there's li liquid in there. Does that interfere with the headspace test? That's a good question, I like that. So with the needle in there, it's kind of, okay. So the chemistry on that needle, you know, I'm not, I'm not pulling sample out per se, I'm putting the sensor, that, that, that Florence and sensor, into the package. And ideally, you want it into the headspace. If you do go into the liquid, the effect of what's going to happen is that it kind of kind of slows down the result of getting it. You can still get a measurement through liquid. In fact, a lot of those sensors, on that, there was a previous picture where I showed a sensor inside this meat package. You could put that sensor inside a bottle with liquid inside. Maybe you, know, you did something to it, and it, and it can touch the liquid. It's not a bad thing to the sensor. Effectively, however, it slows down how long it takes to get a result. Uh, that, that, that needle test, that optical test, the fluorescence test with our instrument tends to be a re relatively, actually pretty quick test. With, you put it in within, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, you got a result. If the liquid's on there, it could delay that through. Uh, and then if it gets too contaminated over time, it may affect with your calibration. So all depends kind of on how you use it. Okay, okay thank you. Next question is, how many inches of vacuum are typically pulled in a destructive bell jar test to detect a 250 micron hole? That's a good question. And I can get back to you with that process. I think different people will do different things. Uh, we look at the standard that I referenced. They should have you know, a list there on what they did. Um, a lot of times people are doing this based on the custom package that they're looking at. Someone may need a little more vacuum to get at that tautness of it, some a little less. You also don't want to get too much where you might pull the seal or seam apart. So I think a lot of that can be standardized around it. 
And if someone was really doing this in a process, you could put almost together test method validation where you can put control leaks on it. So I can get, I'll, what I'll do is I'll consult the ASTM standards, see what that guidance is, and some colleagues that I have, and I can get back to you with more information. All right, next question is, do you have any advice for bread in map packaging as we find a lot of pinholes? That's a good question. All right, so, boy, I personally don't. So I work a lot on the analytical side. Can we find things? Can we, the whole, how they affect it? I do have some colleagues, uh, food scientists, that I can ask a little bit more. I guess the question I have is, in the bread that you're, you're, you're sealing it, are, are you actually sealing it? Are there seams and heat seals and things involved? Or is it more like the bread off the store where there's just a, it's crimped together with some kind of wire band or wrap around it? Uh, if it's not, because that would be, you know, you could have really great leaks through that. But it, well, let me assume it's like a bread or a baguette or something like that that, that you've done it with. Um, I would think that what you would do is, uh, yeah, you know, let me let me ask some more questions about that and get back to you. I'm yeah, we can definitely, we have their information, so we can get back to you on that question. For yeah. Sure. Yep. All right. Next question is, are systems needed for testing? We tend to see same readings with or without and testing laminated film. Okay, great question. So the idea of a septum is trying to create a, uh, a method to put my needle. So I showed you a, a sensor that had that fiber optic tip to go through. I also showed another method where we're going in and we're inflating a packet. Actually, two methods where we inflated a packet. One was where we inflated it, put it underwater. The other one where we inflated it and looked for pressure decay. So septas are, 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 are materials that are, that are rubber or closed cell foam with a very aggressive adhesive on one side. They have a hole in the middle. And what they do is they're designed to grip very tightly around the needle that I'm putting it into. If you have a package that innately grips tightly to it, uh, to, to, to the needle, you can probably get by without the septum. And I would say, if you're doing a headspace test, you put it in, it's holding tight around it, and you're not really worried about room air linking in. But if I was doing one of those tests where I'm pressurizing the sample, you would absolutely need a septa, I would think, in order to get a good result. Otherwise, you'd just be leaking out that area that I just pierced into the sample. But a lot of it now is designed on your packaging and how well does it actually, you know, stick to, or, you know, how well does it conform to the needle when you put it in? And if you've got a large headspace, you know, I, I can imagine that in practical purposes, if you validated that you get the same results both ways for that typical, that package configuration, that needle, that would work out very well. And that my experience is that probably works best with collapsible packaging like pouches. So if you're pulling out some headspace out of it, it's not pulling a vacuum. If you had a rigid tray with a, with a seal on it, it, you potentially pull a vacuum inside there. Now room air can leak in around that area of that needle where uh, a septa should have been. Okay? All right. Um, some of these questions um, are a little more detailed and will probably need more information. So those we might we may skip over and definitely have Joel follow up with you afterwards. Um, let's see, we do have a couple more that we can answer here though. Are there factors that can degrade a product with um, a matte package? Yeah. Other factors? Sorry. Other factors, yeah. absolutely. So I talked about distribution a little bit. You know, if, if you look at the cycle where your foods go through and, and it reaches some higher temperatures, it creates reactions within them or degrades them faster. So I look at temperature is one you know important thing. Um, when you look at even if you've got a refrigerated product and it's put into a case, you know is the case effectively cooling it uh, in all areas of the case? Um, that could be one. One another one I think is pretty interesting. I've seen recently um, from a colleague uh, at a local uh, university uh, is really cool research is as lamps are improving in our supermarkets, in, 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 our, in our different places. People are going from fluorescence uh, to LEDs, and high-intensity LEDs to showcase the product and make it more attractive. What we're seeing sometimes is maybe I put a meat product, or I put a product in a map environment, I chose my materials correctly, 
but now I'm exposing it to light, and maybe different UV and different intensities that can now create color changes uh, to my product. So, you know, I focused on this presentation around that map environment and verifying that you have what you intended and in maintaining that. But there definitely are other factors that even if I created this really nice map package, if it goes out into an environment that I didn't, I didn't really expect it to go into or if it gets challenged by things like the UV from a light, from a high intensity uh, light, um, that can definitely you know, impact the shelf life of that, of that package. All right, and I'm gonna do one more question here. Uh, do you have any insight on moisture condensation that forms within map package products? Well, my only insight is, is, you know, there's a lot of high humidity and it got cold and it condensated. I mean, what's the, you know, so I mean, that there's physics around condensation and, you know, when people look at RH and percent RH, they don't always think of the temperature effects on that in, in, in dew point and things like that. Um, yeah, so that gets to be very, very um, particular about specific products. Do you need condensation into a, a liquid product? It doesn't really matter if it's supposed to be a dry product or a frozen product that goes through this heat thaw cycle. It could be an issue. I don't really have a lot to comment about it, but it, you know, if you've got a very high, uh, you know, I'm assuming you've got a very high water content, it means your product is good with you know high water activity around it. And water activity, you know, I don't want to get in the whole science of food science because there's a ton more that I don't know than I know. But, you know, there could be a concern if you do see condensation. But it depends on that product. You know, if it's a dry cereal, absolutely. You want your cereal to be crunchy. Um, so I think a question like that really has to be in context of what's the product that you're packaging it in and what's the cycle that it's going through from processing to being sold in the marketplace. All right, thank you, Joel. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, um, please don't worry. We will have Joel follow up with you afterwards. Uh, if you have any additional questions that you, can, that you think of after the webinar, please feel free to send those to us. You can send them to info.mocon at amatech.com, and we will follow up with you. Um, please note there will be a short survey after you log off. If you would take 30 seconds to fill that out, your feedback would be greatly appreciated. And um, that will wrap up today's webinar. We want to thank you all for attending. We hope you found the topic to be informational and value to you. And we hope to see you at our future events. We want to thank you, everybody. Have a good day or evening. Goodbye. <laughs>